So he's an expert on uh, two-dimensional systems and recently has taken some interest on topological matter. Okay. So thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here again. And, uh, and I also have to thank the warm hospitality of the center. I'm spending uh, almost two weeks here visiting uh, Alexandria, and we are trying to uh, finish or begin <laughs> some, some uh, new projects. And uh, yeah, so he's my collaborator here. So today I, uh, I, I present a, a slightly different uh, title at, uh, to Nathan, who invited me to give a talk on topological insulators, strong disorder, amorphous. And uh, so when I was planning to uh, organizing my, my talk, I decided to, to, do, uh, to make a real large introduction, since I guess uh, this is not the main topic of research in the center. And so I'll try to give you a perspective on why is this important and also to motivate how things were evolving in the community. And well, I hope to be successful in that. And then at the end, I'll present my own contribution, which is highlighted here. Is a work I have been, I published with, with Marcio Costa, who is now professor at Federal Fluminense. And, Adalberto Fazio and his uh, students. Okay, good. So uh, the outline is, uh, I'll begin with uh, real basic stuff. I'll present a zoology on metals, semiconductors, insulators, and then I'll, I'll uh, make a very, I present a very, very fast or overview on the main tools that we use, our, we theorists, to compute electronic transport properties of different materials. And then I begin the real stuff here with a reminder on the quantum Hall effect, which is uh, something which is more than 30 years old, but uh, it's, uh, it seeds and uh, actually uh, the main ideas that were uh, developed there helped us to build on this new physics I'm going to discuss today. And then I, I move to topological insulators, discuss some simple models and my own work. So let's start from uh, the very basic. So electronic transport, the scales, right? So when you, uh, when you want to, uh, when you think about uh, theory to model all different uh, uh, materials and uh, uh, let's say uh, structural properties, uh, electronic transport, heat uh, transport, et cetera, et cetera. When you go to, um, to uh, transport, you, uh, you, you uh, easily uh, are confronted with a falling problem that uh, you have to have a theory that will explain the metals, like has, have resistance of, in this funny units here, bulk units, 10 to the minus eight, which is very, very small resistant, up to insulators, which is 10 to the min plus 24. So it uh, spans uh, more than 30 orders of magnitude. And this is our great challenge for a unified theory in condensed matter, right? So uh, basically, this following scenario now, we have, uh, basically we have uh, theories which uh, are uh, very adequate for metals, others that are used to semiconductors, uh, others that are used to insulators. And uh, not necessarily they talk, talk to each other. There are whole plethora of different phenomena. And uh, myself, as a theorist, I'm, I'm uh, really working hard on trying to, uh, you know, like, uh, connect the pa different patches, establish connection bridges, and, and, and try to formulate things in a more ordered way. OK, so um, uh, well, the, the previous <laughs> slide was a little bit uh, misleading, because uh, for uh, these different scales, we, we actually understand uh, how to explain uh, the basics, which uh, is the uh, zoo that uh, this is uh, physics 101 that uh, you understand the difference of a metal, a semiconductor, and insulator by looking at the electronic states. Basically, if you look at the Fermi energy, uh, and uh, if you have a large density of states, uh, the Fermi energy, this guy is a good conductor. There are uh, uh, states that will conduct from point A to point B from source to drain. If, uh, if the gap is small, and small I mean, well, different ways of activating gaps, but let's say fractions of electron volts or even electron volts in different circumstances, dope materials, then this guy is a semiconductor, which is in between these two. 
And if the gap is really large, it's, uh, there are no states that can transport electrons from one side to the other, and then obviously uh, the guy is a very poor conductor. Now, this is not to say that we understand it quantitatively, but qualitatively it's pretty easy to have a guess. So today I'll speak about uh, metals and insulators, and the main reason is I, I found a hero of this crowd here, Pauli. <laughs> who uh, in the 30s uh, wrote a letter to Pyle saying ba basically that you shouldn't work with semiconductors. They are just, uh, you know, they're just bullshit. <laughs> and nobody even knows if they, they exist. So this is my free translation of this letter. And it's uh, really written in very heavy tone. <laughs> so if Pauli, uh, you know, that's a very, very important guy, said so, then we will go to... Uh, discuss only metals and insulators today, right? Although my main, main part of my career work in semiconductors. Um, so let, let's, uh, let me tell you this. Um, I mean, give you a really simple-minded overview and uh, beginning with solid states 101. And uh, so if I want to compute the classical transport theory of, uh, of any kind of material, in particular uh, a metal, sorry, then uh, basically, if I put a bias here, I put a difference of uh, a gate uh, different, uh, uh, so I have an electric field forcing a drift of the electrons through a disorder landscape, then basically uh, there is a force acting on the electrons and there is this, uh, this basically uh, a drag that uh, won't allow them to accelerate indefinitely. And if you put the balance between the two, you will readily write the current density and, uh, in, uh, and a proportionality between the electric field and the current density is this conductivity. And uh, this is the standard uh, uh, expression that was derived more than 100 years ago. So the only thing that uh, Drude didn't know how to do, or one among many different things that he didn't know how to do, is that this relaxation time, for this to understand the relaxation time, you need quantum mechanics. You really need to know the disorder or different uh, phenomena that are in this metal to, uh, to compute realistic rates of relaxation. But basically all the rest and the, the understanding that this is, was a diffusive process that depended uh, on, on the density of states of the Fermi surface, et cetera, et cetera, was, uh, was built early on in the game in, from 1930, from 1900s to 1930. And, and, this, uh, and this formula was basically the best you could do until the 50s. Huh? So later on, people understood the effects of uh, quantum mechanics beyond just the relaxation time, and uh, people really developed um, different theories, uh, Boltzmann equation and things like that, where you, know, like you start to, to uh, begin to incorporate quantum phenomena. But uh, the real uh, uh, next step was uh, ah, sorry, uh, I just uh, forgot this. Uh, this is important for us, so <laughs> sorry for that. Uh, if, if you include the magnetic field, you also know how to compute all this stuff by, by Drude, and actually uh, then uh, you have this asymmetry, and then instead of working with a simple uh, con conductivity, you, you have a conductivity tensor, and then uh, uh, the resistivity depends on you have a, a longitudinal and a transversal resistivity, and this is basically the Hall effect, which is also among uh, 100 years ago uh, was discovered. This is going to be important when I, when I discuss the quantum Hall effect. So this part is understood classically. The rest is quantum. Sorry. So let's jump to the track again. So the next thing I want to flash here, which will be important for the remaining of the talk, is the Kubo conductivity. And basically, this was the next step, linear conceptual next step from a theoretical point of view, which was developed in the early 60s, right? Linear response theory. And, uh, and people started really to, uh, to address problems of uh, uh, quantum corrections to the classical formula uh, using this approach. So why is that that uh, condensed matter or electronic transport took so long to recognize the importance of quantum mechanics. Basically temperature, right? So uh, the history is uh, like that. So the first uh, systems which are very, very interesting to understand quantum phenomena were nuclei because the distance between levels is, is uh, basically so huge that temperature plays no role, at least near 
near ground state. And here for, uh, for condensed matter, basically uh, temperature smears most of the quantum phenomena until people really started to look at different scenarios, low temperatures, et cetera, et cetera. And, and so uh, this is a very simple theory. Right? So you put an external field in different gauge. Suppose that I choose that one. Perturbation theory. And then I compute the k-state contribution to the dens current density. And then playing the same games, I can uh, actually compute the conductivity in terms of uh, these states. Um, you know, different uh, uh, expectation values of operators. And so uh, if I want to do a realistic calculation of any given metal, what I need is a, a almost realistic description of this, a good description of these states and the energies or the densities. And that's enough to, uh, to be on the game. So this is a very iconic thing nowadays. We, we know how to compute this to a very good precision. And so we have the tools to be really quantitative for different kinds of metals to compute uh, uh, the conductivity uh, at uh, close to uh, zero temperature, and even uh, including other processes like phonons, et cetera. We, we are uh, quantitative in this respect. So this, is, this is, uh, has been developed over many, many years, and now it's, it's a current standard for, for computing bulk properties, okay? What's that? Hmm? Oh, sorry, this is the Fermi distribution function. So uh, basically, uh, so uh, uh, if you have a small bias or a small temperature difference, this, uh, basically this difference will give you a very narrow window so where all the action happens, right? So this is due to Sommerfeld, this, uh, this concept. And so uh, actually you don't, know to, uh, you, don't need to know, uh, you don't need to know the properties of these wave functions and energy dispersion over the whole band only over a narrow band, and that's enough to compute transport properties. This is, from the technical point of view, this is enormous simplification for people that do calculations, right? Okay, so this is the... So uh, the, the, yeah, uh, so the, there, is a, there is an imaginary part to this, so, uh, uh, and uh, this is a tricky part to deal with. Uh, and, uh, and it has to do with absorption. It gives you the, directly the absorption of, of different uh, 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 dissipation phenomena here. And depending on the model, you have to do it very carefully. It has, has uh, many technicalities due to inversion of, uh, if you take the volume going to infinity or the imaginary part yeah, first. Just playing that game doesn't appear in the imaginary part. Huh? Uh, just playing the game that you wrote down at the end. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the, it, because uh, what I what I, I cheated here, <laughs> so I always have to uh, regularize these uh, denominators with a small imaginary part, and uh, how you do it uh, meaningful and uh, extract uh, the, the the imaginary part of this uh, is is uh, is is a discussion which was actually sold in the in the 60s, 70s, but it has to do I with that. Huh? Sorry. Yeah, yeah, well, you know, yeah. yeah, at least you were not a professional physicist by then. <laughs> but it's written, it's in the books. Okay, so, and the next ingredient I want to shine very, very quickly to you is uh, that um, as, as uh, you know, as the sample fabrication advanced, people started to produce uh, smaller and smaller samples. People are not only interested in bulk, and then uh, basically uh, uh, the geometry matters. And for instance, nowadays you can produce uh, things like, which are called nanowires, for instance, where the distance between, uh, where you have, uh, for instance, a barrier here, and electrons are confined to move in the central region. And uh, the distance can be a few nanometers. And uh, depending on the Fermi energy, you, you have only few modes allowed. Well, everything that I discussed before was just bulk and integration over the whole Fermi surface. And now you are really probing some discrete features. And, uh, and this has been actually even measured that you have quantization of these modes depending on the width of this, uh, of this wire. And uh, you can understand that very easily by, by, the, by the following. So these electrons, they have a quadratic dispersion relation, obviously. 
And then there is an energy threshold to open every one of these transversal modes. And so uh, the band structure of such, uh, of such a system is just uh, uh, a sequence of parabola. And if you cut at the Fermi energy, you, uh, you realize which modes are open and which ones are not open, right? And so then, then you see that it begins, uh, you know, like sometimes you like Kubo, sometimes you like things like that. Sometimes you use even Drude or Boltzmann, and, uh, and uh, you are, you know, like sometimes uh, it's nice to have the, your favorite theory at every point. But uh, at the end, we as theorists, we like to believe that all these theories, if they're correct, they should give the same answer. And this is, uh, is going to appear soon. Uh, well, okay, so uh, coming back to that, so uh, this is a summary. I was, uh, a Kubo is good for that, and for that we uh, probably need something different. Uh, but we know that if you have a gap, you have an insulator. If you have a metal, you have a, a, a full density of state, a finite density of states at the Fermi energy. And so we come to the uh, integer quantum Hall effect. So and this is Klaus, uh, Paul Klitzing. Did it two years ago, I guess, no? And, uh, and now he's into, uh, actually more into, uh, into uh, uh, you know, like developing standards for measurements. And he has his own co uh, constant for, for uh, a standard of, uh, of resistance. And uh, basically, uh, is ba this is basically related to this uh, conductance uh, quantization. So what, what is the integer quantum Hall effect? The integer quantum Hall effect in the sketch is like that. So I explained to you uh, very quickly that in the classical limit, you can, uh, you can compute or you can calculate the longitudinal resistance, resistivity or the transversal resistivity, and it gives you these two curves. As you uh, use good quality samples in uh, 2D and low temperatures, what you see is that this uh, 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 transversal uh, resistivity it uh, starts like that, but then it develops these steps, right? It, uh, the overall, the average is the same, but it has these funny steps. And the steps are quantized and proportional to this von Klitzing uh, constant. And if you look at the transverse, so at the, sorry, this was the transverse. So if you look at the longitudinal resistance uh, for sufficiently uh, low temperatures, as you increase the magnetic field, what happens is that it starts something like uh, not really constant, but almost. And then it starts with the peaks. And these peaks correspond to these uh, jumps in the, in the, in the, long, uh, to the, to the jumps between plateaus in the transversal resist, uh, resistivity. And this was, uh, in the 80s, was a, a big mystery. Why? Because if you look at the, uh, the uh, band structure of these systems, uh, if you put a magnetic field in a flat surface, you develop this uh, Landau levels. And the Landau levels, they, they are quantized and depend linearly on the intensity of B. And this, uh, you have this fan diagram, if you wish. So I plot it here for any given number of value, fixed values here, n equal to 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. And if I cross here the Fermi energy, I see that uh, that at any given, uh, that uh, uh, between these two lines, there is uh, no state. So it should be an insulator, right? So it should be a conductor, just one, uh, a good metal, just when you have states in the Fermi energy. And this is more or less why, yeah, you can argue that this is what happens here. Every time that you cross one of these Landau levels, you have these nice peaks, but you don't know, explain why these guys are always behave like a metal. Is this a metal or is this uh, 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 an insulator? And, and this is again this uh, uh, von Kitzling constant. It is, uh, I mean, it's quantized like that, okay? So and this was, uh, was the, 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 the riddle, well, the, the thing. And then people uh, uh, started using, for instance, um, Kubo formula. They could explain that, but not that. <laughs> And to explain these plateaus, people use this uh, second scenario I showed you. So the idea is that basically you have these flat bands. These are the Landau levels. But once you approach the edge of the system, then these uh, guys, they bend. 
And depending on uh, how many of these uh, guys are open, you can count them and you see that, uh, that uh, you know, quantize uh, transversal resistance. And uh, one other thing which is funny is that at, in one edge, so if you uh, look at the derivative of uh, uh, dispersion relation here, you see that guys at this edge, they always move uh, uh, in the positive direction, or say like, like they are uh, uh, right movers. And uh, here they have the different uh, signs, so they are left movers. So it means that in one edge you move in this direction, the other edge you move in that. This you can actually infer from the experiments in different sophisticated scenarios. So th then that, that was a contribution by several people. It took him some years to realize that. And, uh, but then, you know, like, it's funny. You, 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 to understand uh, uh, the transversal resistivity, you need this theory that doesn't explain the other, the, 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 the bulk. <laughs> And the bulk, you need another theory that doesn't explain that. So it's a very uncomfortable uh, picture for all of us. Until, uh, ah, and then let me, uh, so let me uh, make some advertisement of things I'm doing. So uh, actually, uh, what I explain is one aspect of the integer quantum Hall effect, but uh, it has more, you know, like, uh, for instance, you, you understand that the systems are disordered, and there is a quantum phase transition. There are extended states near the peaks and the localized states here in the valleys, and you can compute them or you can actually measure them. And, um, and one of the interesting things is how uh, to understand the slope of these peaks, of these jumps. And uh, people have argued that this is a phase quantum phase transition, Preuss cannot. And uh, he actually, uh, with the help of experimentalists, they studied different samples and found some uh, universal single uh, parameter scaling curve, and they actually measured this exp critical exponent, right? And the critical exponent, uh, collecting all the experiments we have over the last 30 years, uh, it goes like that, and uh, a very small error of 1%. And theory, uh, at the beginning, was a big uh, error bar, and people were very pleased, saying, well, we understand. But as the computers uh, got more sophisticated, the error bar of the experiment, uh, the, of the theory also uh, uh, shrinked. And nowadays we understand that we don't understand that. <laughs> so these two uh, theory experiments are not consistent with each other within the error bars. So, and then that's, that's one of the questions which are left after 30 years <laughs> of quantum hall. And uh, this is very disquieting. So, uh, um, all this uh, Preuskin uh, uh, actually explained using renormalization group, and uh, it's called Preuskin renormalization group because uh, Kamelnitsky discovered in 83 and Preuskin in 88, but Preuskin has uh, uh, put it the right way. I mean, this is the way you present modeling. He just uh, twisted 90 degrees, <laughs> and, <laughs> and so you, you, uh, you have, a, a, depending on this order, you have a, this fixed point that all the states are quantized. And so this is the result of our G flows here. And uh, well, and so uh, no, the advertisement that we are trying to do the same with graphene and trying to find the critical exponent with a new approach, numeric approach, unfortunately. And uh, but unfortunately, yeah, well, with postdoc, Leandro, who you know. And everything is progressing very slow because uh, the student left to Urbana and now she's interested in different things, so <laughs> yeah, well, uh, so we are doing by ourselves now. Okay, coming back to track. So uh, when, I, when I make this big detour, and uh, well, I'm fascinated by this story, and it's 10 years that I'm thinking about it. So uh, uh, this is why I included. Um, uh, when I started with this detour, I explained to you that there is a theory that explains the transversal uh, uh, resistivity and doesn't explain the longitudinal. And there is another theory that explains the longitudinal but not the transversal. This is very bad. And, and so this was, uh, this was the status in 88, uh, 90, when this gentleman came to, uh, to uh, th this problem was disturbing this gentleman here and as a bright guy, uh, he said, look, I have to explain the longitudinal uh, resistivity using Kubo as well. 
That's, I mean, the, 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 all the elements are there. It's not possible that our working tool that we developed for 30 years will not explain that. And so uh, uh, he uh, actually didn't have the computational resources we have now, and he uh, actually um, uh, uh, simplified a bit the problem and used a lot of analytics and wrote the Kubo formula in a very, uh, for us, or for, for the, at that time, in a very unusual way in terms of, in reciprocal space, in terms of these wave functions and derivatives of the Hamiltonian with respect to different variables. And, uh, and that was uh, easy to compute at that time. And then uh, he showed numerically that uh, the, 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 tra uh, the transversal conductance was actually uh, uh, expressed in multiples of e, e squared over h as the experiment shows, right? So that was a major uh, achievement by Fowler, Komoto, Nightingale, and Denise. And then he was speculating why is this object actually quantized, right? And at that time, he didn't know. And uh, at the same time, sorry? Yeah, the thing is this. So at that time, uh, the simulation of the Cubo formula was sort of uh, very uh, complicated due to uh, computationally. Nowadays, it's simple. Uh, but at that time, it was complicated. It's a disordered system. It has many terminals. And uh, people, are, you know, uh, this is a, just the bulk. Uh, I mean, the experiment is in a different setting. This is the bulk result. So he did two things. First, he reduced to the simplest possible model that would capture everything. And then he uh, uh, reduced the, the expression to a workable, I mean, to that, which looks nasty, but it's, it's far more simpler than anything else because you know the analytical part of that. But here you have to include disorder. And then uh, he was simulating that and show that it's integer, that the, the conductance is integer. So at that time, in a different part of the world, there was Barry looking at inter very different uh, kind of problems. So he was interested in, uh, in uh, adiabatic evolution of a system, driven system. And, uh, and so he proposed the Barry phase to uh, so show that any cyclical variation of a system Hamiltonian the eigenstates, I mean, remain in the same, the states remain in the same state, so it's adiabatic, and they are modified by a phase factor which is cast like that, right? So, uh, well, and uh, if you do some more math, you can write uh, a Berry connection, write everything, all this theory you can write in terms of the Berry connection and Berry curvature. And eventually, uh, these guys, the Berry curvature can be expressed in terms of the eigenstates. Uh, and this is the external variable that is adiabatically varied uh, in this way. And it's, uh, it's a way, convenient way to cast it. And then, uh, and then uh, uh, right after Barry wrote his papers, his uh, seminal paper, people are, uh, started to, uh, to do all sort of uh, variations and uh, uh, apply his ideas to different things, including nuclear physics. People were actually looking at different nuclei, neighboring nuclei, uh, saying that this psi here could live in any space. And then remarkably, uh, if you look at this expression by Barry, it's the same expression as the one derived by David Thales. <laughs> and then uh, uh, David Thales was able to show that uh, if you integrate over the phase space, uh, you eventually uh, can map that into, a, into a, a, a topological invariant called the first Chern number. And this guy is either 0 or 1, or uh, depending on, on different number of things. And so uh, uh, he was showing that in the case of the quantum hall, this guy acquires integer numbers. And, uh, and then off, I think. Five years after the first work, <laughs> he came up with an interpretation in terms of topological invariance of the quantum Hall effect. So that's, uh, and uh, so, huh? No, that's the thing. That, that's the thing. So uh, uh, the, the original idea of Berry phase 
is that you have a system which depends on, on an external parameter and you vary this parameter very slowly. And once you close a cycle, the wave functions, I mean, you stay in the eigenstate, in instantaneous eigenstate, and the wave functions acquire a phase. Now, the thing is that formally, formally, the expressions that Barry derived, right? So forget about the external drive, right? Uh, and replaced by anything. For instance, here, uh, an integration over phase space, right? And if you uh, label the eigenstates by, by, by an index which is related to the phase space and you integrate over the phase space, the expressions are formally identical. But the advantage is that whatever tricks Barry used to formulate his theory and uh, write it in terms of, oops, sorry, of, uh, of this uh, Barry connection, it, then it's easy to show using different uh, theorems that the integral is an integer. Well, that's the, that's the whole story. So uh, in other words, so uh, if, you are, if you are a practical person, you say, well, um, just, uh, uh, well, Barry uh, uh, Thales showed that if you use the Kubo formula and you do a numerics, you get integers. Fine, I'm happy with that. And then he did something else, which was relating to things which are, have uh, very little connection to condensed matter in, uh, in formulated theory in terms of some uh, topological invariance. And, uh, and then it remains to be shown if this can be generalized to uh, further uh, things. There are other systems beyond the quantum hall that uh, actually are interesting, or if this is a, a story that ends there, right? And it's the, the last half part of my talk, is it's showing that the story doesn't end. I'm still missing. Uh. Go back to the equation. This one. No, the one of the... This one. That one. Uh -huh. What is actually doing here? You are saying integration over phase space, but physics is what is happening. So, uh, yeah, okay. So the integration uh, uh, that uh, in the Kubo formula, you integrate over all k's in the Fermi surface. If you have a 2D system, then uh, you integrate over the 2D K space, right? Not closed. Which is not closed. Yeah, correct. But then, uh, depending on, I mean, and then what these people have shown is that can even actually use a Stokes, uh, Stokes, Stokes theorem, what was, uh, and reduce this to a line integral, a closed line integral, using the tricks that Barry has developed for his stuff. And then you map. Right? Doesn't mean that you understand, but you have a, a, a perfect mapping between two theories that are uh, uh, explaining two different things. Right? So, we, yeah. So. Uh, no. The, yeah, they, they had. They had. So uh, the, this is one thing. I, I'm sorry, I didn't say. So. Yeah. No. Sorry, I, I didn't say. So. Uh, 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 what, what, what we understand nowadays as 2D materials, as 2D materials, are really 2D materials. So it's a sheet of, uh, of graphene or uh, TNDs or phosphorine. It's a sheet of, uh, of a crystal which is, has just, uh, which is uh, one atom thick. There is nothing, uh, you know, like this is a 2D. Uh, yeah? At that time, uh, these were the 2D materials uh, available. So, uh, it's a slightly more complicated thing. It has been developed in the 70s, 80s. But basically you have, uh, sorry, I, did, I wanted to avoid that, but it's a semiconductor. <laughs> so uh, you, you grow a, a semiconductor and then uh, you have a, a, a heterostructure where you have the, a, a, a top of the semiconductor, for instance, an insulator. And then depending on the 2D materials, you actually, uh, uh, by, by doing that, you create a potential which is confining the electrons in a, in a very narrow region. And, uh, and the magic is that the Fermi energy is such that only, you can only populate one transversal mode in this direction. So, so actually, yeah, so that's the, so you have your system and then uh, you have a, almost like a, uh, we have a big expert on that here. <laughs> Triangular potential. So this is the insulator. Later. 
This is the semiconductor. Conductor. You have, uh, for instance, uh, in this direction. Uh, so this is uh, uh, this is a growth direction, but then I I, I draw here. Uh, so this is the potential in the Z. And then the Fermi energy is like here, and you have uh, levels like that. Only one level is allowed. So you have, uh, you have a system, you have a 2D electron gas over the whole uh, plane and uh, populating a single state, or a transversal state. And these were the 2D materials at that time. So quantum Hall is a two, uh, 2D uh, material kind of physics. So I wanted to avoid that, but yeah. Nowadays it's easier to make them in a variety of systems, right? Uh, at that time, uh, just these, these guys, nowadays you, you know how to uh, grow other heterostructures and you know how to grow uh, materials like that. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, if, I, I would like to know if, if what Paul thought had anything to do with that. Yeah, so the thing, uh, let, let me go back. That's a good uh, question I wanted to address later, but it's a good point to, uh, to say something. OK, so I guess this is the one. So um, one of the big issues that was uh, there was a lot of, um, let's say, um, controversy in the early days of the quantum Hall effect is that, as you said, uh, these 2D materials were, uh, were disordered. Not strongly disordered, but sufficiently disordered. So nowadays you can produce much better quality uh, materials, but at that time it was the best you could do. And we know that once you have disorder, all these uh, ideas of uh, writing down simple solutions for the wave functions, et cetera, et cetera, is not really very good, right? And in particular, uh, you have all these uh, explanations of how things work for transport based on, on edge states, like I showed you before, and clean systems, and uh, integration of Kubo formula over simple wave functions. And in distinction, people were actually understanding other properties of the system uh, uh, in, in a very complex way using uh, extended localized states, phase transitions. So things didn't really seem to match, right? And uh, what, what was nice about, uh, about uh, uh, Thaula's final result is that uh, once he showed that this guy is based on topology, topological ideas, and, uh, and, uh, and the integer quantum Hall effect does not require very clean systems, it requires actu uh, actually the systems were, were, were disordered, uh, he also uh, understood why this quantization was robust against disorder because this is a topological property. So uh, uh, effects of disorder wouldn't destroy uh, this, uh, this topological property. And that was the way Thales uh, ended the story, uh, saying that this was a, a quantization was robust as the experimentalists have seen a decade before. So that was the missing piece, right? How could quantization not be topological? Huh? How could quantization not be Well, you, can sh you have to show it, right? So at that time, all this was, was uh, you know, the, these ideas were not connected. You have these integers. The explanation was based on geometry. And uh, there was no explanation based on bulk or, uh, or uh, you know, something related to a mathematical object like that. So integration of a thorus or a phase. So that, that was... I mean, there was a lot of speculation. I was not a professional physicist of, uh, at that time. So as Gaston was said, I was not born. Uh, well, so <laughs> but uh, I don't know exactly what was the evolution. I, I'm, 
I'm telling you uh, the things I, I learned from talking to different people and uh, from what I guess uh, from the sequence of publications that appear at the time and the, and, and the questions that were still open. So, okay, that was a little bit too, too slow, sorry. But uh, if you get the idea, the rest is simple. So uh, uh, then comes another guy into play in 88, late, and uh, was a mathematical physicist. And he said, oh, that's nice. So you have all these topological properties. Let's play the different Hamiltonians. And so he played with model Hamiltonians with, a, uh, with uh, based on, I mean, products of uh, Pauli matrices, linear dispersions, and absolute, if you read the papers, there was no motivation for that. He was just having fun. And then uh, he uh, basically uh, uh, proposed this model and looked at, uh, at, uh, at these D functions, the sines and cosines. And then he found that depending on the values of uh, this R, uh, you have uh, different conditions and uh, playing with, uh, with uh, integrations that uh, Thales has proposed. Uh, 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 he computed the churn number in analytical expression. This was just simple to calculate. And he predict predicted different, uh, uh, re uh, different regimes where, where a material with a dispersion relation would be a, a metal or it would be a topological material. And this paper remained uh, you know, sleepy for 20 years. <laughs> because there is no realization for this guy, right? So that, that was just a model. Huh? Until uh, these two guys, Ken and Manley, said uh, in the early days of graphene that graphene could uh, be a realization of the Haldane model. And that, uh, that's when everything started. So uh, basically, they took this uh, Hamiltonian with, dip, uh, with a linear dispersion relation, and they added something which is a <laughs> property of real materials. Uh, uh, spin orbit coupling, and the spin orbit coupling will generate the states, which were surface states, and this will be the birth of the topological insulators. So basically, this paper, if you read, if you recast the ideas nowadays, you say, look, we do have a way to realize this uh, topology, topological phase. If we find materials that have uh, uh, a strong enough uh, spin orbit to produce the states. So they were wrong. Graphene was not a good guy for that. But people soon found other uh, different semiconductors here, quantum wells. And this was the first, uh, this was a science paper 10 years, 13 years ago. And it caused a lot of uh, draw. It was the birth of this field from the experimental point of view. This is actually a controversial result because this plateau is, is not really quantized, but comes close. So people are spending a lot of time producing better materials, uh, better theories. But the interesting part here is that uh, if you have a 2D material in, at each edges, you have a spin texture. So uh, for instance, spin ups, they move in this direction, spin downs there, and the other way is reversed. So it's an interesting uh, way. So it's not like uh, the other ones with uh, broken time reversal symmetry. Uh, where you have just all electrons moving one direction in one edge and the other uh, here depends on spin. And this uh, spin momentum locking is actually the, one of the explanations why is this so robust. In order to, uh, to destroy quantization, an electron moving with spin up here will have uh, e either to flip spin to be backscattered, uh, otherwise moves forward, or it has to have uh, uh, face uh, uh, some sort of disorder that will uh, 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 move it to the other side, so it will uh, backscatter again. And these sorts of disorder, depending on the system, which is sufficient, if it is sufficiently large, you have a huge uh, momentum transfer, and this doesn't happen. So that's the idea of protection. And, uh, and so this is another view graph of that. So you see that. Uh, quantum Hall is beautiful. This is a crap, but, ah, here, sorry. This is really a crap, but people have improved on that, and now it's looking better. There's still some, some things we don't understand, but most of it is fine. And, uh, and then uh, uh, people also uh, studied uh, 3D materials, 3D topological materials, and, and the idea is that 
uh, in a, this topological insulator, uh, uh, there is this bulk edge duality. So it's uh, insulator at the bulk and conducts at the edges. And here's the same. It's an insulator in the bulk. It conducts in the, in the surfaces. So I guess I, I forgot one transparency, which was important to explain the concept. But, but this is the picture, right? And so people also realize this 3D topological insulators in, in, uh, in, uh, in different materials. For instance, this is bismuth selenide. Bismuth is heavy, has a strong spin orbit, and it's responsible for that. And people have measured uh, ARPIS, the band structure is, works fine. Conductance experiments are tricky here. Okay, so we have done some work in that as well. So, and then, and then the last 15 minutes, let, it, let me tell you what I have done and, uh, and my, in, uh, share with you my perplexity. And, uh, well, let's see. So, the idea is, uh, in, uh, from everything I told you before, you have this topological insulator, and now the idea is, do, do we understand this order, right? And, uh, for instance, uh, what uh, Thales has computed, and many people after him, is uh, this, this invariant, which is good for systems which break time reversal symmetry, which is the first Chern number. And uh, this here, as Gaston asked, is an integration of uh, the Brillouin zone that you can eventually map into uh, a closed circuit. But you have to have this Brillouin zone integration. But Brillouin zone is a concept that is uh, good for crystals, right? You have time reversal, uh, time, uh, if you have uh, translational invariance, then uh, you can uh, think about brilliant zones or uh, primitive unit cell if you go to reciprocal space, the brilliant zone. But if you have a very disordered system, what, what does it mean, right? So if you have disorder, there is an absence of translational invariance. Is this really clear? And, and then for us, is like um, people say, well, you know, like it's a topological property, it's protected, but can you be can you quantified? It's protected perturbatively, it's protected forever, no matter what you do. And that's, that's the kind of questions uh, we have been asking lately. How robust is this, uh, is this uh, topological invariance uh, uh, reflects on the conductance? And so in ordinary metals, for instance, we know that disorder cause uh, Anderson localization. You have trivial insulators. In topological insulators, if you have strong disorder, you have a new topological phase. Can you speculate on that? So uh, all these are open questions, right? Now, uh, then, then uh, we came up with a very different idea based on, on an interesting paper here. And... Uh, Actually, this is a very nice idea. So uh, th this is a PRL from three years ago now. Uh, and these guys, uh, uh, two uh, guys from India, they had this uh, following idea. So what if I just uh, have a material which is not really, uh, uh, no, like I don't start with a crystal and I make it this way. I, I start with an amorphous material. There is no brilliant zone to begin with. Uh, is it possible that it will satisfy some of these Haldane conditions and exhibit uh, topological phase? Yeah. And uh, so they, they started with a model system. And this is uh, as, as, as disorder or as amorphous, if you want, a random set of sites. Just uh, throw in. Yeah. And then you say you, you invent some rule for for electrons jumping from one side to the other, so you, you, you have a Hamiltonian. And, uh, and then uh, the trick is that it has, every side has a substructure which resembles uh, this Haldane Hamiltonian, which is a candidate for, for a topological material. And what they say is that, well, they, this is purely numerical. They diagonalize this guy. They see that there are lots of states concentrated at the edge. All these states here, for instance, are, are regular states. And exactly, uh, uh, for instance, if you take, uh, uh, this was uh, periodic boundary conditions, then you don't have the edges, then you have a real uh, 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 gap here. If you take uh, open uh, and periodic, uh, oh, oh, if you take uh, 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 open boundary conditions, then the states appear and they fill the gap. 
And then uh, if you compute the transport, so if you attach two leads to this guy, and I mean, uh, theoretically, then you see uh, conductance quantization perfectly appearing exactly at the point where this gap is. And there is no, and then, and then there are localized mid-gap states, all these uh, things that uh, are fulfilling the conditions for a topological insulator. But the question is, what is the topological invariant here? There's no way to compute that, right? So you have a system with this edge, bulk edge duality, quantization, all the things that you need for, for a topological insulator, but uh, you cannot really characterize that from the beginning, right? And uh, so that was a nice paper. And then people started to uh, do variations over that. It was another PRL uh, a year later by other guys that uh, use amorphous quasi-crystal insulators. So you put quasi-crystal with some disorder, you see the same kind of things. And then there were some guys doing experiments with metamaterial, which is kind of, uh, I don't know, yeah. Uh, yeah, so it's a, it's a system constructed to be, to be mapping the, the, the Indian kind of uh, system. So it's an analog computer. But this was not uh, interesting. This is another nanoscale paper uh, where people took a thin film. It's not really 2D in strict sense, but uh, a thin film of uh, bismuth selenide, and they see uh, uh, properties of a uh, topological insulator uh, in the transport, so this is in the surface. So, um, so this is how it stands. And then uh, what uh, we proposed here, ah, and then there was this bismuth end paper where people synthesize a new material, a 2D material, uh, with a very large uh, spin orbit uh, uh, component. And this guy is a topological, a 2D topological insulator when it's really clean. And people understand that why, and, and calculations match the experiment, and uh, everything is fine. And so uh, uh, we decided to, uh, to study if we can uh, make this uh, system here amorphous, and if the topological properties survive. And that was the, the content of our work. So this is basically things that Alexander knows much better than me, electronic structure calculations. And then you have uh, band uh, uh, calculations by, band structure calculations by Marcio Costa. And then there is a topological gap uh, here. And, uh, and then there is a, a, an interesting recipe of amorphization theoretically. So uh, developed by, by uh, Marcio and, and uh, Gabriel Schleder. And then they will just uh, break some of these bonds, let the system relax let the system reconstruct, and eventually uh, iterate that until you get uh, some sort of uh, amorphous system. The problem is that these are very heavy simulations, and then you can do with small uh, system sizes. For instance, 400 atoms takes a week. <laughs> and uh, then you compute, uh, for instance, things like that, pair distribution function. If you have a perfect crystal, this is what uh, people from crystallography take a lot of fun at looking at these peaks. Once you uh, destroy uh, uh, the, the, the order here, all these peaks, they become uh, really very uh, broad. And except for the first and the second, which are the, the distance between first and second neighbors, all the rest is just a grass, almost a constant. Uh, it falls uh, like a 1 over R. And then uh, we have a recipe to, to, to generate these guys. And then we compare uh, our recipe with a, with a number of uh, hexagons. I mean, normally this is hexagonal structure. But then uh, once you amorphize, you, you can uh, monitor how, much, how many hexagons, pentagons, and heptagons you have. And then you stop when you, when you, uh, when you, you get something which is uh, similar to other amorphous uh, systems based on carbon-based like uh, amorphous systems. This is something realistic. And then you do the calculations, right? And uh, basically, uh, uh, the, the big result here is that even if you have this uh, amorphous system, you have this conductance, quantized conductance here. And um, the open questions are, you're starting to close this gap. And uh, we are 
still don't understand by how much. And, uh, and uh, we are still lacking on some, some uh, topological invariant. And well, uh, well, let's skip that. And then uh, that's what's going on now in, in, uh, with the group. So uh, people uh, 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 were very concerned about uh, having very small systems. So uh, this new student uh, decided to play some like Lego. So you can treat like 400 atom systems, but then you can patch different ones, like a Lego. And then you can make uh, very long systems. And so this is one by patching three blocks. And this is one by patching 50 blocks. And what we learn here is that the quantization remains. And once you exit this region of a topological gap, then, as expected, the, the, the conductance should go to zero. The states should be an insulator, right? And this is just to show that this is not sufficiently large to, uh, to uh, capture all localization properties. And uh, we're working on that. So the future on this uh, business uh, is this. So uh, uh, we need another invariant formulation for that, right? So uh, and then. Uh, uh, two things. First is all this theory, which is beautiful, was formulated for non-interacting electrons, right? What happens if you have electrons which are strongly interacting? Then all this, uh, or for instance, non-Fermi liquids or things like that. So then all this story about brilliant zone doesn't, doesn't make sense because uh, the whole concept of quasi-particles is, 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 is gone, right? And, and so these guys here were really concerned about that question, how to extend uh, this uh, formulation based on single particle to include interactions. And, uh, and so uh, they made a lot of effort to, for instance, formulate uh, this integral here, which is the first Chern number, in terms of Green's functions. And Green's functions could be either single particle or many body. And so they, uh, they uh, showed in this three se sequence of three papers that, for instance, for the first Chern number, you have a very complicated expression based on Green's functions, which uh, they can show that it uh, maps one to one for uh, crystalline non-interacting systems. The two expressions are the same. And then you wish or you hope that this still persists as being a good uh, uh, measure or a good uh, topological invariant once you put interactions. So we are interested actually in a guy that involves spin, which is Z2. So we, we, we unfortunately don't have yet this guy for the Z2 topological invariant, and we're working on that. And our approach is different. We are not really interested in, oh, not really interested, we wish, but uh, our goal now is not to treat many body systems with interactions, but we, our goal now is to treat amorphous systems. And for that, we can compute the Green's functions. And then uh, if we have this uh, topological invariant and the Green's functions, we can actually probably understand or uh, check if uh, this is a bona fide uh, indicator of uh, topological phase in an amorphous system. Right? And in the same way that uh, Thales did, uh, right? it's not new. I mean, Thales did more or less the same thing uh, uh, 20 years ago. But now it's a bit more, uh, it's, it's also a challenge because this, this guy doesn't ex exist yet for the Z2. And this is what we are investing now. Okay, so that is the end. Uh, uh, I just want to emphasize the theory of topological insulator is based on band structure properties, and for that, you, you, you are happy with, uh, with translation invariant, invariants. For strongly disordered systems, the transport properties have only a v weak relation with the pristine material electronic structure, so does it apply or not? And yet, we find numerically that uh, so far so good, it applies, but <laughs> We still don't understand very well why. <laughs> and this is what uh, we are working now. So what is the relevant topological invariant? How to describe this metal insulated transition and closing of the topological gap in these systems? OK, so thank you very much for your attention. That's uh, everything I said.
Hi. I have a simple question, actually. So um, do you expect, if you have a topological um, isolator, do you expect at a very high temperature, do you expect that this topological phase disappear? Uh, I mean, very high temperature compared to the natural scale of the problem. So there are two answers to that. I mean, uh, uh, if, if, you, uh, if you start with temperature, if you start to excite different degrees of freedom, right? And uh, for instance, phonons and stuff like that, then yes, uh, depending, um, depending on your system, you might spoil the, the things, right? But uh, as far as, uh, I mean, the standard theory that we are treating here, right? So if you have the topological gap, as soon as, you, uh, as your temperature is smaller than the topological gap in, in the scenario that we are describing things, then you're safe, right? So you start only to destroy when, when, when you know, like the electrons, they access the, the bulk states, and then you're gone, right? But uh, yeah, so that, that's more or less. So, uh, but uh, high temperatures, they, uh, they open new degrees of freedom, and, uh, and then the formulas that we're using are, you have to generalize. We know how to do it, but you know, so that's the idea. So is that? Explains what you okay. I have a more of a technical question. So, so how many realizations of the amorphization do you do? You do ah. for the calculation for that? A few. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the thing is, uh, uh, for instance, uh, in this uh, the first study, the nano letters, um, they have uh, five or so. But uh, basically, the, the whole thing was to have an amorphous uh, system, and then you uh, iterate, and then, uh, so it's like that. If you iterate very, very few, if you break very few bonds, then you, it's actually not, not so much fun. But then as you uh, increase breaking the, the bonds and let it re uh, relax, then you reach a situation where um, most of the properties don't change over a while. And then after a while, if you break too much, then, then uh, it's basically disconnect, it's not stable again, et cetera, et cetera, and then it's gone. And all the realizations we have are, are in this plateau, right? Now, uh, there, there are five more, three times more, and the idea is to have 10 times more and, and to play uh, uh, averages and try extract localization lengths and all that stuff. Yeah, so that's So can you actually measure this topological invariant, or is it just some theoretical object? No. You measure the, the conductance quantization, right? Yes. So, uh, and then, uh, for instance, if you have, uh, uh, if you have such a, a 2D system, you have access to the uh, conductance quantization, and uh, it coincides with uh, the first Chern number. That, that's, that's fine. Yeah. Say, so what is the relevant topological invariant? It's some, some object? Oh, some, yeah. Something which you measure in your... Sorry, I wasn't precise enough. So I'm, I'm dealing with uh, 2D. Yeah, so what is, what is the status of that? So of, of this research now, in my, my modest point of view. So the message is, uh, so we have a proposal for a, a, a topological, amorphous topological system, which is bismuth, if you don't anneal, if it's topological, we say, hey, go to the lab, you can measure that, and you see this, oops, oh, whoa, whoa, that was too fast. You see this uh, plateaus here, right? Uh, sorry, is it quantized the plateau? Is it yeah. supposed to be two exactly? Is that the idea? Exactly. So it's. And perfect. can it be one or three, or is it just no, always two? No, it's two because there is one channel and there are two, uh, two spin species, spin, spin up and spin down. So how can you tell if it's quantized if there's only one value of it? Don't you have to have at least more than one to see that it's quantized? No, the thing, the, 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 the big thing here is that in principle for ordinary systems, the transmission could be any number. Yes. Yeah. But then uh, the magic or the, the big thing here is that within the topological gap that you learn where to find from band structure calculations, 
the transmission is exactly two. In some right? natural units, okay. Yeah, so uh, okay. That, that's, uh, and in this system you cannot, uh, in distinction to the, to the quantum hall, you cannot go beyond because uh, it doesn't allow it. Just uh, either, either yes or no, okay. and there are two species, right? Two units of the fundamental, fundamental constants. Of the fundamental constants. Yeah, here it's actually, it's the transmission, it's two. But then, then the thing is, um, uh, it's fine, right? Now, now it's nice, so you do, do your calculations, et cetera, et cetera, and, uh, and, and the computer tells you, well, you find it, but is there any uh, deeper reason why is that so? Can you relate, I mean, this is a heavy numerical calculation. Can you relate any of these ingredients that go into the calculation to uh, the fact that this is, this is uh, perfectly two, or you have to do the calculation every time again to different, for different materials? And, and so the idea here is, uh, is this. So if I have an amorphous system, and I, I'm not allowed to use the ordinary topological invariance because I don't have the, a brillion zone to begin with. I have to come up with a different kind of, uh, of, uh, of indicator, right? And this is what we are looking for. So, and then the issue is, is this indicator going to be interesting for, for, uh, for other systems? Is this going to uh, be used for a next research? I don't know. but. Uh, this is certainly a, a, a missing item in our, in our list. So uh, our computer understands we don't. So that's the status of, of this research right now. Any further questions? So if not, let's thank Kai again. Yeah, thank And uh, Kai is here until next Tuesday. Yeah. He's in run room 102, so if you want to drop by.
can. No, 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 no. I don't. Sorry. I want you to restart the clock. Start. Okay, it's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to come back to Sao Paulo once more. Uh, so I'm Vivian. So I'm gonna talk about uh, research that I've been doing on cosmology and in all these epochs of the universe that I'm gonna define uh, in the next slide. And I'm gonna start this talk by emphasizing what are the main points I, I want to come across all of you. So I hope to convince you at the end of this talk that one, the universe has, broadly speaking, three epochs that I'm going to call early, intermediate, and late. Sounds good? So yeah, so let me just repeat that sentence. So I, that the universe has, broadly speaking, three main epochs that I'm going to call early, intermediate, and late. Two, I'm going to show you that there is still uncertainties uh, in the physics that dictate the dynamics of each of these epochs. And more importantly, I'm going to show you that those uncertainties can all affect the current expansion and current structure formation that we see in the late universe. Therefore, if you want to uh, understand questions like what is the nature of dark energy or what is the nature of dark matter, how gravity works, we need not only to understand how this epoch works, but you have to have a holistic view and try to figure out the entire history of the universe at once. Uh, so let me just, I'm not sure for all cosmology, so let me just start with like, what is this basic feature? Like, what, what, what are the main properties of the universe according to the standard model of cosmology? So in the Big Bang Theory, uh, uh, you start, you know, big explosion, I'm not gonna talk about this, but what is important is that right after the Big Bang, within its first second, you have the first phase of accelerated expansion in the universe that is called inflation. Um, um, way after that, at 300,000 years, uh, the universe cooled down to temperatures around 0.2 EV, and that was temperatures that were low enough uh, so hydrogen atoms could recombine. So from here to here, the universe were ionized, and then uh, on recombination, the universe for the first time on its history uh, became neutral. Notice that uh, although I'm talking about hydrogen, I said temperatures are around 0.2 to 0.3 EV, not, not temperatures of 13.6 EV, and that's because the, our universe has a lot of photons uh, per number of variants. So this phase, you know, from the, from the beginning uh, up to this um, epoch of recombination is what we call, uh, and, and what I would define, as the early universe. Um, and here, another aspect of here is that um, on all these epochs, uh, relativistic species like radiation, neutrinos, they play a very important role uh, on the energy density of the universe. For most of, most of the time, they were dominant, but, then, you know, they, but for all of them, they were pretty significant. So after that, the photons of the so-called cosmic microwave background were emitted. For the first time, photons could propagate freely in the universe. The universe became dominated in its energy budget by non-relativistic species. Um, that is the, and that's what I call the intermediate universe, up to a, you know, a few hundred million years where the first stars are formed. Um, and the, the gas of the universe at that time didn't have metals, it only had hydrogen, helium, uh, and very light elements. Uh, and you know, if you study astronomy, you see that metal lines are important to cool down the stars. So because you don't have that, stars were pretty big. They have like uh, dozens of solar mass that emitted a lot of EUV photons that just reionized the universe. So the universe became ionized for the second time in its history. 
That's what I call reionization. And that is between, in the epoch between recombination and reionization is what I define as the intermediate universe. That epoch here will be the epoch that will be probed by 21 centimeters, both on the ground and very futuristic uh, on this um, space. After that, from here up to today, is what I define as the late universe. So now, for the first, broadly speaking, half of this epoch, the universe continued to be dominated by um, non-relativistic matter, like baryons and dark matter. Structure formations continue to grow you know, for galaxies and clusters continues to be larger and larger. Uh, but then a new component arises, and the universe, for the second time in its history, uh, started to accelerate it. So you have, for the second time, an accelerated expansion. Um, a lot of other things that happen here, here is, for example, where the, the baryon physics uh, becomes higher in our universe. You have black holes uh, that, you know, sources AGNs. You have um, stars going around. You have supernova explosion. You have all this baryonic physics that you have to incorporate uh, in order to use uh, the properties of the universe to extract information about its evolution. So this is also, uh, because it's, it's the closest to us, uh, is, the, is the era that we basically probe using optical astronomy, using surveys like the Dark Energy Survey, LSST, and so on. So you see that you have all these different epochs that has different properties, uh, so, and, 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 and the light that are emitted from here, either from here, or from here, or from here, they all have to travel the entire universe to reach to us. So how can we extract information from all these epochs with all these different dynamics? Well, to do that, you need to have different types of observations. So I, broadly speaking, uh, uh, like to call the modern school of cosmology uh, the four main types of observers that, that we use. That one being the cosmic microwave background, which is the ra this radio signal that I'm going to talk about later, uh, which is also was the, the, um, the topic of my PhD. You also have observation of type 1a supernovas, as well as um, the local measurement of the Hubble constant. Um, another group is use gravitational lensing of optical distant galaxies uh, to try to understand how structure formation grows, as well as counting the number of nonlinear uh, um, structures like clusters or voids that can you know, provide a very useful information on, on, on how structures are evolving time. And the second, and the, third, the final one is what we call the baryonic acoustic oscillation, which are reminiscent of the physics that form the cosmic microwave background. So we have all these different types of um, observations, and we have a single universe that has to be consistent in all of them. Um, so one way you can um, play uh, and test that consistency is to, for example, take a subset of these uh, observations, and let's say, for example, the cosmic microwave background and baryonic acoustic oscillations, and then you see what kind of universe uh, these um, these observations prefer, and then you compare that universe to the universe that other types of observations, like gravitational lensing or optical galaxy, or observation type on a supernova, the local uh, value of the Hubble constants prefer, and you see if the, these universes are consistent to each other. So that's the game we play, and people have been playing this uh, for a long time, and you got pretty interesting answers. So here, I'm showing you uh, on the um, y-axis, um, the, the value of the Hubble constant, the local value of the Hubble constant, and, and, and across years. And in the red, I'm showing you the predictions, not the measurements, the predictions of the Hubble constant given by the cosmic microwave background. And in blue, I'm actually showing local measurements of the Hubble constant that use type 1a supernova, as well as calibrators, uh, cephates to measure distances in astronomy, which uh, usually is, is a pretty hard business. Uh, and you can see that they are doing a pretty well job in advancing the field. You know, we've got better predictions, we've got better measurements over time, but their disagreement, and this disagreement is increasing in statistical significance with time. So here we have now a five, between a five and six sigma um, 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 tension, depending on, the, on your suppliers. You can now. You can also measure um, the, the value of the Hubble constant through other means. I have used, for example, strong lensing. Uh, you can also use gravitational waves. But there is still a, a few years um, um, uh, a, a 
away from to, to get the precision and the accuracy that you can achieve with the cosmic microwave background. So if you go back 10 years, 1990, how, how does Hubble constant change? Does it change pretty fast? Uh, so the, for the CMB, you, if you go back to COBE, you could not, you need a part of the CMB spectrum that I'm gonna show later that was not measured by COBE, so the first satellite was WMAP, so you cannot actually go further. And I don't think you actually go further uh, in terms of the local, local measurements. Yeah, so people use calibrators and, 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 and the predictions varied widely. You know, Hubble didn't know if the Hubble concept was 50 or 500 kilometers per. Could be. Okay, so if you believe that the, the, the correct universe of the standard model of the cosmology is a universe that's predicted by the cosmic microwave background, uh, then you, you conclude that the universe we actually observe in the late time is a universe that's expanding way too fast. We can play this game with another parameter called S8, which is an interesting parameter that mixes physics from the, the background evolution as well as from structure formation. And this is the parameter that is measured by gravitational lensing of optical galaxies. And, and, and the reason why gravitational lensing mixes um, background and, and perturbation is that you, know, you have a distant um, galaxy that emits light and you know that matter uh, creates gravity and gravity distorts light. Uh, so you know, the, the gravity of our matter between the galaxy and us will change the path of the light, it will change its shape. But uh, the way the gravitational lensing works is that um, it's most sensitive to matter that is half away between us and, and the source galaxies. So because of that physics, uh, gravitational lensing is sensitive to both the background expansion, to distances, and also to structure formation. That's why this parameter makes it. In that case, the universe that has higher S8 is a universe that is more inhomogeneous at least in those scales of eight megaparsec, that's why the number eight. On the other hand, you can also have two universes, A and B, and you can fix the amount of inhomogeneity on both, so to make, to make them equal, at least on scales of eight megaparsec, and in that case, the universe with higher S8 has more dark matter on it. And you can see here the predictions from the cosmic microwave background versus measurements of gravitational lensing of optical galaxies from very different surveys. The error bars are big, but we are learning how to combine them. There's a lot of cross covariance in the systematics, and systematics is the key for cosmology today. Uh, and, but we, we, we believe that we have something between two and three sigma discrepancy, um, which can increase to the five sigma threshold that we usually like, um, to, to make a discovery um, in, in, in the next few years. Uh, these, um, these, the difference between here, which I didn't quite, is so one of them includes an infrared satellite that in, you know, has uh, complementary data and the other does not. Uh, so they are not exactly the same data. Okay, so what I just show you is that if you believe that, you know, that um, the universe given by the cosmic microwave background and, and also the baryonic acoustic oscillation is the standard model of cosmology, then the universe we see from gravitational lensing of optical galaxies, here I'm just showing you a strong lensing, we actually don't use, um, use weak lensing, but it's, it's the same um, in terms of um, um, physics, uh, and, and, and h naught and supernova observations, then this is a universe that is expands way too fast, and it's either too inhomogeneous, at least on the scales of eight megaparsec inverse, or has too little dark matter. Uh, and for a lot of years, we thought that these results could imply, and basically imply, uh, that dark energy, which is this component that is accelerating the universe today, it's not given by the cosmological constant, which is uh, the, the, what the standard model assumes. What I want to show is that before we conclude that, we have to be a little bit more careful, uh, and we have to understand what happens um, before uh, dark energy arises. Okay, 
So just, I need, the mathematics that I need now, is I need to make a brief introduction about correlation functions so you understand how we actually extract information uh, from these observers. Um, <coughs> So here I'm showing the map of the, this, the cosmic microwave background that is this radio signal that is coming to us. Uh, this, this bath of radiation is a, almost a perfect black body uh, that has a monopole of 2.7 Kelvin and it's almost isotropic. It's, but it has little anisotropies in the intensity of light in different directions of order of 10 to the minus 5 Kelvin. And here I'm showing this map is, the, you know, is, is these differences across uh, in, in, in galactic uh, coordinates. Um, so the way we extract information is that we take a, a radio telescope on, in the South Pole or the satellite and we point to one direction in the sky and we measure the intensity and the polarization states of that, that, the, the, the bath of radiation and then we do the same in another direction and then we compare those and we make averages over the sky uh, at fixed angle and with that you, get, you can get all the correlation functions of the intensity of that light all the correlation functions of the polarization. We actually have two polarization states, but here I'm just simplified to just one, um, just for the, the sake of the, uh, um, the explanation. But you also can have um, cross correlation between uh, the temperature and the polarization state of that uh, um, bath um, radiation. And that is what we measure on the cosmic microwave background. <coughs> Theories, on the other hand, uh, uh, like to get their intuition in Fourier space. So if you take the Fourier transform of those autocorrelation functions, and in particular the Fourier transform of the temperature autocorrelation functions, you get what is the, called the temperature power spectrum here. Um, so you have now angular multiples instead of angles. Um, and what I want you to understand now is that that Fourier transform has the following features. It has this plateau at large angles, uh, large L's, low L's, large angles, and it also has this series of oscillations that has very well-defined position and relative amplitude to that uh, plateau. And we use those, those positions and relative amplitudes to extract uh, the amount of dark matter, to extract um, what is the curvature of the universe and how many dark energy we have. It's these positions and relative amplitude that tells the physics um, that you know, generated them and, and the contents of our universe. That's what we do for the cosmic microwave background. Uh, people like Professor Rosenfeld here, he, he does a similar job, uh, but on the structure formation today. So here is a map, uh, a simulation of the universe, how it looks uh, today. This is the dark matter, I'm not including baryons here. So you can see the universe is very clumsy, and you have halos, you have big voids that has, doesn't have anything, um, almost doesn't have anything. Um, and. Uh, if you assume for now uh, that you could see dark matter, that you have a telescope that, you know, where dark matter appears, you could play the same game. You could point this telescope to a position in the sky, see if there is an overdensity or underdensity in that direction, and correlate to overdensities and or underdensities in other directions. We don't have a dark matter telescopes. Uh, uh, therefore, we have to use tracers of dark matter, put galaxies or clusters. These are biased tracers and unbiased, the, the business of unbiased then, it, it, it's pretty tricky, but the conceptual idea is the same. Again, physicists like to take the Fourier transform. So here I'm showing you on, on, on the bottom what is the Fourier transform of that, um, of that correlation function. And, and I want to emphasize a few things here. First, I'm plotting the cosmic microwave background and the matter power spectrum up and down. And you can see that in order, physics that changes one usually changes the other one. And they have to, you have to have consistent, consistent change. You can see, for example, the oscillations we see here. You also see here, you see it's, it's weaker, but you can also see these are the baryonic acoustic oscillations. So, but you can see there's this consistency between them. I, I, another thing I want to show is that this is a parameter that defines the physics of inflation, that, acceler that the first phase of accelerated expansion that happens within the first second of universe existence. And you can see that you know, physics that happens in the first second of the universe can affect everything uh, that, uh, you know, that happens afterwards. 
And that's the difference between cosmology, that is an observational field. You know, we only have a, one universe. We, we, we see the light that goes through its entire history from you know, an experimental uh, science where you can build a laboratory and kind of isolate the variables uh, that you don't care about. Sorry, I, I can't. This is a fictitious experiment with real numbers coming out. So I'm confused. Where did these numbers No, come no. From? This is real data. Of what? That's uh, what I'm trying to ask. Of so, dark matter? This is the tau spectrum. So if you, if you take the correlation function of over densities and under densities of dark matter, which that we can observe to, through bias tracers, and take the Fourier transform of that, you got these data points. This is a very old data set, but... but how seriously should I take the data? That's what I'm trying... You, there's a bias, as you said. Yeah. How serious is that problem? So, uh, it's not that a problem because you can use different tracers, so for example, there's weak lensing, and you can also count the, the nonlinear clusters, the nonlinear, uh, uh, so you can make correlation functions between the, the gravitational lensing, how galaxies are distorted by uh, this gravitational uh, field, this is just ellipticities. You can make correlation functions between how galaxies are distorted by gravitational lensing and the counting of clusters or the counting of nonlinear structures. You can also make correlation functions between them. And the, and the trick here is that this all depends on biases on different ways. So if you use these multiple correlation functions, you can actually uh, um, figure it out what the bias and unbias are uh, uh, the, the measurement. That's what we do in the in dark and survey. If another author did the graph, he would come up with similar numbers? Is that the claim? Yeah, yeah, so, okay. yes. The, the Planck 2018 have um, a map that has a very nice plot that has the different experiments and they are very consistent to each other. Okay, so this is the introduction. Um, I want to talk about um, now uh, things um, research that I have done on the early universe and how it can be connected to other epochs. So my main focus on the early universe is, will be on inflation. So as I said, what is inflation? Is this epoch of accelerated expansion in the first second. How is generated? Broadly speaking, uh, this is a very famous plot from my, my turn, and broadly speaking, we assume that the whole universe were dominated in its energy density by a scalar field here that is rolling down a very flat potential. So being almost flat means that there is almost you know, no force. It's, um, and <coughs> is, and that, if, you, if, you, if you calculate what is the energy density and the pressure uh, in the energy momentum tensor of, uh, of a scalar field that, is dominant, that has a very flat potential, you get an accelerated expansion. Um, this is also called slow row because on, on top of this potential, you also have the universe expanding, which creates a friction to the kinetic energy of this potential uh, in a such a way that you quickly lose all information about your initial conditions, and therefore you have that the velocity of these fields only depends on its position, which is a good feature from inflation. So you have this... This, this, this scalar field also has uh, perturbations, and those perturbations will create the, the, the seeds for galaxies and voids that we observe today. So why do we need, so why do we need to put in our standard model this accelerated expansion at 10 to the minus 33 seconds? Well, there are a few problems that the inflation solves. Uh, one of them is the horizon problem. So, Again, this is a real data, real map of the cosmic microwave background and isotropies. And I want you to see by eye that the universe here doesn't appear to be vastly different from the universe here. The universe seems to be, broadly speaking, isotropic. But if you calculate without inflation what is the angle that a photon can travel from the beginning up to today, you get an answer about two degrees. So without inflation, we don't know why this, this patch of the universe would not be connected to this one, and we will have no idea to explain why then these two very different patches here look, broad, statistically speaking, the same. Inflation solves that. Another thing that um, I like to talk uh, to my students and, uh, is that inflation also gives you the seeds that uh, you grow through gravity to produce galaxies in the voids. And it produces the right kind of seed, seeds that has the right statistical properties. So here, I'm showing you that Fourier transform 
of the, of the our correlation functions of photons in the CMB, I told you that it has a plateau that is not seen here because of the scale of the plot, and it has all the different seeds. And just for comparison, I'm showing you, uh, before we measured the, the, those uh, oscillations, uh, we thought that other types of mechanisms could create different types of seeds. So just for illustration purpose, I'm showing here predictions for another type of source, which is called cosmic strings, which was this topological defects that were generating, uh, uh, that were popping up in the universe and generating um, uh, um, seeds, you know, that inhomogeneities uh, in the matter field. And you can see it, Two different things here. If you have the wrong seed, the one that uh, is this is called iso curvature, you produce a plot that is where its first peak is displaced by the peak we actually see by um, a pi over two. You can see that the first maximum is to its minimum, and you do not see these oscillations of the CMB. So you have to produce inhomogeneities in the universe uh, to get galaxies and, 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 and voids and stars, but you also have to produce the right kind of it, and deflation does that. <coughs> so given that, I hope I have convinced you that you know, inflation has solid predictions, and, and so what is the standard numerically, like mathematically, what is the standard prediction for inflation? You know, so again, I'm showing the same type of Fourier transform here of the temperature field. And, and, and basically, inflation, at least in that vanilla form that has scalar field rolling down potential, predicts that, uh, that there, is, there should be a primordial power spectrum here that looks like a power law, and they, that has an amplitude and a tilt and these are two or the six parameters that are free in the standard model of cosmology. Physics that happen after the inflation, the acoustic oscillations and, and lensing and whatever happened after will transform those seeds into these oscillations. So that is the standard paradigm of inflation that I want to test. You know, is this, you know, is the, are the seeds com have a compatible with the predictions of this power law? So this is something that I have done extensively in my PhD. I try to get other models of inflation that has vastly different phenomenology. So for example, I got models of inflation that th where the inflator was rolling down and suddenly uh, got into a step and get a lot of kinetic energy. We c and I, I could give a whole talk about that, why these models are interesting, what is the physics behind it, and I could st stay here an entire hour about that. But for now, I just want to show you that these type of models produce a power spectrum that it doesn't look like this power law, but it has oscillations, damping, steps. It's very different from the power law. So inflation can be a lot richer than what we think. Uh, so given that, uh, and, and we have tested these models, these are interesting, you can constrain these models. Uh, so, it, and this is one way you could approach. You can say, I, I have physics, I will put physics in the standard model and I will see what will happen and what are the predictions of this new physics. Another way you could approach this is the following. Given that, in principle, inflation can be a lot richer than we initially thought, can we can extract what the data wants without thinking what are the physics prior in, on our first round? And the answer is yes. Uh, so this is something that we have done here. Uh, and we try to extract the power spectrum that the data prefers because we think that the physics that happens between inflation and the emission of the CMB is simpler to understand. And so here I'm showing you the 68 and 95% reconstruction of the data itself. Uh, for, forget about this line. And I'm showing you the, the, the basic picture that is a power law. And I just want to tell you that you know, the data seems to prefer uh, something that is different than the power law, so uh, an imbalance of power between large and small scales. Again, I could give a whole talk on why, what do this means of inflation. Does that mean inflation ended right after here? Does that mean there's a step? There's a whole you know, topic about this. But now I want to ask another question. So given that inflation can be complicated, how this complication can be propagated in the cosmology in effect, how do we know uh, what we know about the late universe? I want to make this connection between early and late. 
And the way we make this connection is, is through the Hubble constant. As I told you, uh, the cosmic microwave background can predict what is the value of the Hubble constant. And to use this prediction, it's based on the position of these peaks, these oscillations, and the relative amplitude of these oscillations with respect to this plateau. But inflation, or, or those assumptions of inflation, changes the relative power between this part of the spectrum and this, and therefore it can affect the CMB predictions of the Hubble constant. So we have, see how, how it depends. So here is the local measurement, and here are the predictions. If you, if you this depends on the multiples, uh, on, on the standard of inflation, on red, uh, on, on solid lines versus uh, what would happen if you predict inflation, if inflation predicts this imbalance of power, and you can see a shift. So understanding inflation can be important to understand how the CMB predicts something about the late universe. So what are the other ways that the early... Sorry, what does predictions on dark energy mean? You have a phrase there, no less transfer? <coughs> so the Hubble constant, uh, sorry, I forget. So the Hubble constant tell uh, what, how, how fast the universe is expanding today. And this expansion is dominated today by dark energy. So if you change the way, we, how fast we're expanding today, we have one of the possibilities that we have to change the, the, how the, the equation of state of dark energy or the way dark energy you know, feeds back into the freedom equations and change the, the, the scale factor dynamics, change the way the universe expands. Could be, this is one. Or it could be, uh, dark energy could be a quintessence field, a canonical scalar field or non-canonical. You know. Okay. So there are other ways that the early and late universe can and predict. And, and, and one of the ways, and this is a pretty hot topic in cosmology now, uh, is the calibration of the sound horizon. Um, so whenever you're trying to predict uh, what is the value of the Hubble constant um, through the CMB, yeah, you, I told you that you have this two degree on horizon, but we need to be able to calculate this. So we need to, to be able to calculate how much a photon can travel from inflation um, up to the, the, the epoch the CMB was emitted. So this is, depends on the integral from redshift 1000 versus what happened recombination up to infinity uh, and depends on the expansion rate. We thought the early universe was boring. We thought the early universe before only had like radiation and, and dark matter that we know how to evolve. So we thought we could calculate this pretty well. And with that calibration, we can compute uh, uh, the Hubble constant. But I, I want to ask the question, what if, uh, let's come back here. The question, what if we are wrong? So what if there is dark energy in the early universe? We actually think nowadays, and this is not just speculation, we actually think that there is dark energy. 10% of the energy density of the universe at redshift 3000 was dominated by another type of dark energy. Why do we think that? Like, like what happens if the universe is not boring? There is more neutrinos uh, that we previously uh, expected. These changes. So can the CMB probe it? And then it says yes. The CMB can tell information on what happens in the early universe because the CMB has this horizon, but it also has its damping. So when I show you uh, the power spectrum of the CMB, I show you that there were these oscillations, and the oscillation was going down, and the way it's going down, it's called the damping scale, and, 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 and by comparing the way it goes down to, the, to where it's positioned in its first peaks, you can understand a lot of the physics that happened in the early universe. And the way it's, the, why is that? Is because when you, 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 you see the physics of CMB, you realize that the damping scale and the horizon, the size, the position of those peaks depends on physics at different redshifts at different times. And you can compare them um, to, to see what's going on around here. So for reasons, um, for interesting reasons that not sure I have time to talk so deep, we actually think that to solve the discrepancy between CMB that, that predicts an, a, a Hubble constant of 67 kilometers per second per megaparsec to the local universe, uh, we, we have to introduce um, dark energy. So this is the fraction of the dark energy to the total that we have to introduce. Um, around redshift 3,000, so the, uh, redshift, this is a redshift 1,000, this is redshift uh, 10,000, 
broadly speaking, one of these numbers, and you see that you, know, you have to predict 10 per, 9 to 10% of dark energy, um, um, another type of dark energy, uh, to fill the universe. And these models can predict a Hubble value of around 71 kilometers per, sec per second per megaparsec. So this is another example where, you know, if you don't understand the early universe, you cannot make predictions uh, to the, uh, about the late universe in the sense that uh, you might think that this discrepancy between the predicted and the measured value of the Hubble constant is due to a dark energy. Or oh, maybe dark energy is like modified gravity of something. But no, it might be that something in the early universe that you don't understand. You have to make sure you understand the entire history of the universe in order to understand what dark energy is. So let me understand it. So this is a proposal to solve the crisis of the Hubble, of the present Hubble constant discrepancy. Yes, and, and it's this not proposal, my proposal. Oh, that's not your proposal. But yeah. anyway, this proposal uh, suggests the appear the existence of a different dark energy. Yes, and how this different uh, um, dark energy that would appear at the that this redshift would decay afterwards. Would well, that. Yeah, that is, that's what the theories are trying to figure out. You know, they, they, they are just, for, from a phenomenolo phenomenology standpoint of view, I just have to assume that something behaves as a cosmological constant uh, with the right density up to redshift three, uh, 3000, and then somewhat, somehow, uh, decays to a positive equation of state, W equals one, for example, a very stiff equation of state, and therefore decays really fast. That's what I have to put in the models. Yeah. How I generate that, we don't know. That's right. So this is what I'm concerned about. How, uh, how artificial is this? We don't know how. We don't. And that's why so my job as a phenomenologist is to help the, the, the theorists to say, this is what we need. This is one possibility that can solve. Now let's talk about the physics and how reasonable are these type of models, because there are also other solutions. OK. I understand. I understand the point. Okay. Okay. So, for example, you could, in principle, change the amount of radiation you have in the early universe. Uh, for example, there is this parameter. So we know that we have three types of neutrinos, uh, three flavors of neutrinos. But what if you have more of them? Sterile neutrinos, for example. If you change the amount of radiation in the early universe, you actually change the expansion rate, and there's a, like a pretty significant correlation between, you know, if you put like an extra neutrino that is fully thermalized, uh, you actually can generate an H naught around the, the right value. The problem is that the CMB is very powerful, so you can also um, uh, and check uh, what, what this neutrino will do to the entire power spectrum. And, and, and unfortunately, most of the neutrinos, they produce these phase shifts and damps um, that the CMB doesn't like. And why is that? So the, the reason is that um, neutrinos free stream. Neutrinos um, do not um, have any interaction with anything. So if, you know, and, but photons and barrels, they are tied together and they are oscillating to the acoustic oscillations. So in the sense, I just took like part of this, this oscillation, just like a growing mode, and I'm showing you the photo phase front, and you can see that because neutrinos just travel at, uh, without interaction, neutrinos actually go further than photons. You can see there's more neutrinos here where there's no photons, and because neutrinos source gravity, these actual neutrinos here pushes the, 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 way phase, the phase of the photons in a way that produces this. So this is me, this was not me, but this is a, what a phenomenologist would tell to a theorist. And then the theorist would to try to say, okay, what if these actual neutrinos have self-interactions that slow them down? So this is the talk between theorists and the phenomenologist that we have to do. So this is like another possibility. Uh, and with that, I end the part uh, I'm gonna talk about the early universe. Okay, so I'm going to the second part, which is intermediate universe, which is a shorter part, um, and show similar types of, of in, um, entanglement between predictions in the intermediate universe and other epochs. So I told you uh, we have this um, uh, um, phase called reionization, where stars appear. Uh, we have third and second generation of stars that are very big. They emit a lot of radiation, uh, and this radiation ionizes the universes again. 
So from the problem in physics we have to solve is that we have our radio telescope today, we have the cosmic microwave background photos, but now we have to put uh, free electrons between us and the CMB. And these free electrons will be re scatter the CMB light and changes its anisotropic statistics. So how do we can use this to see how fast how slow or when the universe reunites. Because we have different sources of reionization in the universe. We have stars, we have AGNs, we have dark matter that could decay into UV photons that will irradiate and ionize the universe. We have, and so, can, so can we use data to you know, test those models? And the answer is yes, but for, now, for doing this, it's better to use not the power spectrum of the temperature, the intensity of light, but the power spectrum of one of its polarization states. So here I'm showing the polarization power spectrum, the EE mode, one of the two. And I'm showing you different models of reionization. Here, reionization starts earlier, here starts late, but it's really fast. And you can see that depending on how, uh, where it starts, how fast it goes, uh, that you can predict different shapes that we can constrain with data. So, and, 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 and the function that we are going to constrain is called the ionization fraction, that is zero before we, uh, reionization means the universe was neutral and was one uh, afterwards, means that all the hydrogen atoms uh, were uh, ionized. It actually can get larger than one because each atom of helium has two electrons, but just forget about that technicality for now. So we have this standard model of reionization that thinks that only pop two stars, second generation of stars, ionize the universe. And in that model, the universe, once it uh, starts ionizing, it reionizes really fast. So that's the standard model. It can be tested uh, in a more independent, more model independent way. And the, way, the answer is yes. So here I'm showing the opaqueness of the universe because if you have a plasma of electron around, it will scatter the photon and we create optical depth between you and the CMB. So I'm, I'm showing a plot of this optical depth as a function of the redshift. And I'm showing the predictions from the standard model of reionization, which tells you like the universe is completely neutral and then really fast um, ionized and really, really fast produce the total optical depth. And I'm showing you also some uh, reconstruction that we did with the data that showed that data, at least in the 2015 release, actually prefer something else, prefer a slower rate of increase in this opaqueness. Um, and I could, again, spend a whole talk about what can produce this. For example, we created more, we collaborate with people that are uh, with theories in recombination, and they have models that were first generation pop three stars could create this excess of signal. Uh, you could also do dark matter annihilation, uh, which um, I haven't worked about work on, but um, people have done that after our paper. So that you can do a whole talk about that topic alone. Uh, but I want to ask another question: Given now that we know that reionization can be complicated. How can that feedback into our uncertainty in probing inflation? So this is what we have done afterwards. We will try to, we try to assume that both inflation and reionization are complicated at the same time. And we have showed that you know, the statistical significances of this power suppression of the inflationary power spectrum that I showed in the last session depends on our assumptions of reionization. So things get entangled again. Uh, in order to solve one, you need to solve the other one. More ways intermediate and late universe can be connected to each other. So that recently that it has been proposed, um, not by me, that you know, maybe uh, between recombination and reionization, a few percent of dark matter decays into radiation. And, and if that happens, they are... They, with only CMB, they didn't include baryonic acoustic oscillation, which will make things a lot harder. But in principle, you could at least make the CMB predictions on both the Hubble constant and that assay promise to go into the right direction. So, so is the Hubble problem due to early universe dark energy, is due to dark matter decaying, or is due to late dark energy being different? You need different types of data to answer this question, which, um, and this goes into the direction of my belief for many years that there is not a single experiment, no matter how good it is, that will give us all the answers. 
you need all these different surveys. And that's why, for example, I'm a member of many of them. Uh, because you need to understand the systematics of these different observables, and you need to combine them to get answers that are more robust against theoretical uncertainties. So for example, uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about this uh, uh, tomorrow, but what if, so one of the things that happens in the intermediate universe uh, is that neutrinos that have mass, they make that transition from relativistic to non-relativistic. That happens around redshift 200. Depends on the neutrino mass, okay? And, and effectively, this is equivalent of basically having radiation, a little bit of radiation decaying into matter, dust. It's at least for the standard point of the expansion of the universe. Uh, so we know that here we have dark matter decaying to the radiation, giving us the, the shifting the correct value by just reverse logic, and that's actually true. Neutrinos produce an, a Hubble constant that's even lower than 67. It goes like to 65, and, and that's a big problem. Um, but what if dark energy is really crazy? So we consider like really crazy uh, possibilities of dark energy here using a technique called principal components. And we show that if we don't have a coverage on supernova from redshift one to three, if, if our coverage is only on low redshifts, and this is an important question for future experiments, should ex future experiments only do a lot of supernova in low redshift, or should do they do uh, a broader redshift range? And we show that you know if there's no supernova over here, dark energy can be crazy enough to uh, obfuscate our ability to measure the neutrino mass with comparing, you know, the, with BAO plus CMB. Uh, and with that, I end the intermediate part and go to the last part, which is things I have done about the late universe itself. I just, I can't hear, but. No, no, it's on the side. Can you hear me? No, 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 I don't. He can write and he can. Can you write in the chat, actually? That would be the best. Do you see the chat? If you could write, that would be easier. Can you see the chat? Should I continue while he yeah, writes? Go ahead. Yeah, okay. Then, then I come back. There's no problem at all. Okay, so late universe, okay? So first, we know that the universe is expanding for its second time. You know, we, have, we know the universe today is, ex sorry, is expanding in an accelerated way for its second time. So we know the universe is accelerated today. Um, so how do we know this? There's, there's different ways to know, but one, one is to measure type 1a supernovas. Type 1a supernovas are standardizable on candles, and, and that means that if we measure supernovas in the local universe at redshift 0.01, and we measure supernovas at redshift one, we, we, there is a way that we can know how much these supernovas are intrinsically more or less bright than supernovas here. We don't know the value of that brightness. That's really important. We don't know how bright they are in absolute daily science, but we know their relative intrinsic brightness. We can calibrate this given their light curves, and that allows us to compare this and to get the shape of distance. We, we don't know its absolute calibration. That's why supernova cannot give us the Hubble constant without, without external calibrators, but we can we see the shape of the, how that distance evolves in time. <coughs> And astronomers like to play with magnitude, although the physicists don't, but... Okay, so maybe uh, I see the question now here, if I could stop you for that yeah. question. So Eduardo is asking, uh, you mentioned different models of dark energy. Can you be more specific? What is their physics? So you can have, for example, have a scalar field, a canonical scalar field. So uh, these are the, qu the quintessence models. Um, and it, this scalar field can be only minimal coupled to dark matter. I will show a slide afterwards where you have uh, dark energy being a scalar field that is directly coupled to dark matter. 
you can have modified gravity, you can change the eyes, because in, in Einstein's equation is g mean u equals t mean u, so if you change the way gravity works, you can put everything in the right hand side and pretend it's a different model of dark energy under normal gravity. Uh, so there's all these possibilities uh, that people have been explored. What's the motivation for studying these other models? <coughs> well, first, explaining acceleration is one of them. <laughs> from theory or from data? Okay, so data is that uh, we, we, have, we have all these puzzles. One of the show that the structure formation, like lambda is failing we, in lots of different ways, you know, it's failing to predict the value of the Hubble constant, it's failing to predict the, the amplitude of linear perturbations. Uh, so, uh, th th there are, there's another thing, like when you count the number of clusters, uh, it's kind of failing that, I cannot tell, because this is not that public data, but how, how fault sigma, but it's also, there's like little, lots of little cracks, and like logically one of the possibilities that, you know, we actually understand what is the component of the universe. The universe is just dark matter, baryons and photons and neutrinos, but we don't understand how they source gravity. So Eduardo is continuing and asking, can any of these models be falsified? Uh, that's excellent. Give me a few slides, because I'm going to show you exactly about that. Okay, just, yeah, give me a few slides. Um, and that's, and I'm going to talk also tomorrow about that, how I do that. Okay, so that, so here I show you just for the fun, you know, what, uh, what is the magnitude difference you're going to predict if you didn't have dark energy versus dark energy, you got a difference in magnitude of half, which is a lot, uh, <laughs> a difference in magnitude of one, is a, a different influx of, uh, of 2.5. Uh, so the, 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 an upper magnitude means they are fainter, so if they have the same intrinsic brightness, uh, if they're fainter means they're further away, the universe is expanding too fast. Um, <coughs> So I'm gonna skip this. Uh, so, so this is the present, and what about the future? So um, supernova is an important, uh, is an important observer that will tell how the universe expand. Uh, I'm involved uh, in, in the uh, in supernova group in the W first because we want to check different models of dark energy. And 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 to to complement that question, uh, I, I want to say I, I want to say the following: What supernova can answer? What the, what are the questions supernova can answer? And, and the question is the following. Is the background compatible with the cosmological constant? That supernova can measure. That, that the W first data, which would be amazing, you can see here, compare, like, this is scatter of magnitude versus this, and you can see that we are gonna do a lot better. And you can see that, you know, if, if the background is not lambda, we can check that. So that, that, that's a question. But what supernova cannot do by itself? Uh, so what are, can we probe the assumptions of dark energy, physical assumptions? Suppose, for example, it's not lambda, and you want to create a physical model of dark energy, as um, he, he's asking, what do we need? And for that, I'm gonna show you that supernova is not enough. Uh, so we need also to, me to measure the structure formation of the universe, that, and we do this through gravitational lensing. Uh, so here I'm just, um, Time. I'm just um, tell you again what's gravitational lensing. You have these galaxies that, for the purpose of this explanation, I will assume that are just perfect circular. We, you, we don't need that assumption. And then, uh, and then, you know, the light from from uh, from that galaxy has to pass through, you know, all the matter of the universe. Gravity bends light, and you see a distorted shape here. And then, you know, you can through the comparison of those shapes, you know, to the original statistics of this. Uh, source galaxy, you can reconstruct what is the, the matter field here. So that's why you get uh, linear perturbation. Uh, so this is uh, weak lensing, something that I'm very interested in. I'm also in the W first uh, uh, group of weak lensing, and, 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 and this will tell things like how the equation of weak lensing can tell things like what is the equation of state of dark energy and how it evolves in time. But this is, this is, this is, this is the question. This, this is me answering his question. So I want to do physics. I want to say, okay, if it's not for the cosmological constant, what is the basic paradigm of cosmic acceleration? What, if I'm a particle physicist, what are the simple assumptions I can make about dark energy? And I'm gonna claim that I'll make this four, and, 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 
and, and, and what assumed is for, which for me it seems to be like the simplest thing you can think of from a theory point of view. I will assume GR is correct. I'm going to assume dark energy do not cluster. We know that if it's not a cosmological constant, GR will predict dark energy to cluster, but with a sound speed of, uh, out of the horizon. So what I'm assuming here is that you, know, you will never see a galaxy of dark energy or a planet of dark energy. You know, dark energy will not cluster on scales that are smaller than the horizon itself. And I'm going to assume that like, minimal coupling to dark matter and any particles of the standard model. So only gravity connects them. There is no like, an interaction of dark matter particle, dark energy particle creating something else. And so these, these are physical assumptions of dark energy uh, that you want to test. And here are, from the paper in 2009, all the models you can create that satisfy these assumptions. So you can create the standard model, you can make a curve, you can put a curved standard model, you can put a quintessence, which is a, a canonical scalar field, non-canonical scalar field, you can, you can do all this type uh, of, uh, of models, and you can put uh, dark energy in the early universe, in the, in the only the late universe. There's a lot of things you can do here that will not, uh, will still satisfy this. And what I'm going to claim uh, in my work, of course, is the following, that there is a consistency between the background evolution of the universe and the, and the evolution of structure formation that has to be satisfied if those assumptions are correct. What does minimal coupling mean? Minimal it means that you know, uh, the gravity couples everything. You know, there's the square root of minus g. That's the coupling. Only gravity connects them all. So dark matter could change the gravitational field that that could affect uh, dark matter, but there's no like, non-gravitational interaction between them. So what do, uh, I'm missing something. So the first three assumptions are just you have ordinary general relativity? Yeah. Okay. And the fourth one is, so the for, only assumption is the fourth one, aside from ordinary general No, no, activity. because you could have GR, and you can also have, I, I have a slide about that, I scale a field to be a normal field, and then the Lagrangian of dark matter could be something like this. Sorry, we're talking about dark matter or dark energy? No, so, you have dark energy and other components. So, for example, you could have a dark energy being a scalar field, yes. and that scalar field has an interaction to dark matter yes. that is not just through the square root of minus g. It can have like a direct coupling like this. I don't, when you say not just to the square root of minus g, the square root of minus g is just the ordinary gravity coupling. Yeah, yeah. So, but phi is an independent field. Yeah, you don't have something like this, you know. Uh, and then you have just like some px of phi for dark energy plus, you know, dark matter doing something else, and you don't have, a, you know, you don't have a term like phi dark energy times, I don't know, phi matter, you know, see if, if, if matter is a scalar field. Sorry, it, just tell me a term which is ruled out by minimal coupling. Which term is not allowed of phi? Just so I understand what you the, mean by the paradigm. Yeah, this one, for example, it's not, so. Uh, That's not allowed? No, so I, I'm just, I'm gonna skip just to show you. So for example, if you have an effective dark energy Lagrangian, that, you know, it's a, uh, a dark matter Lagrangian that is like dark energy directly multiplied the energy density of dark matter. You cannot have these types of things. I just don't know why you call that not, that's just coupling of a scalar field to other fields. What? Yes, yes. And that you call non-minimal. Yes, yes. It means it, uh, I just don't know why you call it non-minimal. That's why it's, it's confusion. It could, it's just the way, it just, from, well, because first you can generate Okay, maybe it's a bad definition, I, I, have a, I can explain later, but okay. what I mean is just that you don't have direct interaction like this, only, you don't have gravity connecting them. So you allow cubic couplings, for example, of phi with other fields, which couplings do you allow then of phi? No, what, no. What's a, minimal, what's a minimal coupling which is allowed, just so I understand what no, couplings uh, are allowed. You can have phi coupling to itself, Away, but you cannot have, have any mo any coupling between dark matter and dark energy. You cannot have. Ah, okay. So it decouples from dark. Yeah, energy. exactly. Okay. Okay. I think I understand. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Uh, so if that happens, uh, so to understand this, I'm just going to show here uh, the, the, the mathematical expression of the matter power spectrum. So that's the, 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 the animation that I showed you before. So this is the mathematical expression of, dark, uh, of the matter power spectrum, which tells how dark matter clusters. Uh, and it has this, all these this, uh, this 
factors. Now, it has a contribution from inflation. That's how inflation can change dark matter. And actually, NASA just recently uh, accept uh, as a medium-sized telescope that will try to use that coupling to see how, what is the bispectrum, like how, what is the physics of inflation that, you know, from, from, the, from these observations. You also have some kind of transfer function that, that takes into account massive neutrinos, the acoustic oscillations of the CMB, and et cetera. And we have this K-independent, this is a Fourier space, so a K-independent amplitude rescaling that we call the growth factor. Actually, this product is probably the growth factor. Um, <coughs> and, and my claim is that if those assumptions are correct, then the only way dark energy can affect this, the, the matter power spectrum is through this, this K-independent uh, um, amplitude, rescaling of the amplitude. So that, that's the claim number one. Uh, so it can only change this function here. And the claim number two is that this function here is completely specified by the background evolution. If you know how uh, H, the Hubble, the Hubble function changes a function of z, the, the differential equation of the dynamics of this guy is basically some function of the Hubble function without, and it's derivative without any free parameters, and you can completely specify its dynamics with solving some equation like this. So there's this connection between how this guy evolves in time and the background expansion. Therefore, if you use supernova, W force that can measure supernova to fix the background expansion and weak lensing to fix this guy, you can check that consistency and check if those assumptions are correct. So we have done this. Uh, we have done through supernova. So we, we, we took like water, the best simulated supernova that we could come up inside W first, and me and Carl, we are both members of the same group in W first, so we made this um, theory paper on top of that, and we show that the supernovas uh, that we measure the expansion rate so well that at least inside the upper half of the, all these models that we created, uh, the, 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 the predictions for the growth factor are all within 5% of the predictions of the current standard model of cosmology. Therefore, if W first measure a background that's completely compatible with the cosmological constant, but measures a structure formation that deviates by 10 or 15% from the, the, the current standard model, those, those observations cannot be uh, uh, explained by uh, all models that, that, uh, <coughs> that respect those assumptions Unless, unless, and I don't know the answer because if we haven't done this part yet, uh, you introduce early dark energy. And, for, and, and, and we, the reason we have done this is because to get early dark energy, you have to include the CMB. So it will be supernova, weak lens in the CMB, and that goes to, to my argument before that you need you know, all these different data uh, to answer these types of questions. So this is trying to understand the physics of dark energy as he asked before. Uh, we also trying to do this in a different way in the dark energy survey. This is yet to be published as an internal review, but this is a theory plot so I'm allowed to show, and, and, and tells the following. So suppose you kind of double the parameters of the standard model. So in the parameters of the standard model, you have the equation of states of dark energy, you have the amount of cold dark matter you can have, and suppose you double that so that you disentangle the growth factor and the background. So how now, what is your flexibility now? So how well, you know, you can now constrain them independently? And, and, and you, you see that, you know, if you only change the growth factor, at least in the linear scales, it's just an amplitude shift. If you change these guys, but not change the growth factor, you have a more interesting phenomenology, and I can explain later why things behave like this. But it's, it's also, again, it's testing that compatibility. If you get different parameters here, then that can mean that those assumptions are incorrect. Uh, so what if those assumptions are incorrect? What can you do? So one thing, you can change gravity. There are two ways to change gravity. You can change how Poisson equations, so how matter generates uh, Newtonian potentials, or you can change the way the light is bent by these potentials, which is this parameter here. We are trying to use data to constrain these guys. This depends on spectra, because you need to know how matter 
are, how is accelerated by these potentials, and so you need to know the, the exact position. And here you can use weak lensing to see you know, how light is being distorted, and this is something that we are studying, both in DSY1 that I was heavily involved, and now in DSY on the dark energy via 3. You can also do, as, uh, as I was saying here, you can put these couplings between dark energy here being scalar field and dark matter. Um, I'm showing, I'm, um, we call this coupled dark energy. That means that, you know, that now the, the, the energy conservation of dark energy, uh, rho dot plus three rho plus p, is not zero, but it depends on energy transfer between dark matter and dark energy, and we can also see what, what can do. So there's a lot of things that can happen if those assumptions are wrong. Um, and for that, I kind of finished the physics, and I just introduced one slide of things that I'm also studying uh, so far, I study a lot this year, uh, is that you, know, you have all these, uh, these tensions between different parameters, but how do we quantify them? You know, this is actually not a trivial uh, uh, exercise, uh, and, and, and there's a lot of people that, so there's frequencies, there's Bayesian, uh, and, and this is something that we are trying to address now, uh, and I'm, I'm just saying the following, <coughs> that sometimes not, it's not guided by students, you know. In frequent, in, in frequent statistics, if you know how the likelihoods behave, and you know the number of degrees of freedom uh, in, your, uh, <coughs> in your model, you have an absolutely scale to know how well things disagree. But that's not true in Bayesian statistics. Bayesian statistics depends on your prior. So if we were in 1929, and if we truly believe that H0 could be either 50 or 500 kilometers per second per megaparsec, under those priors, if you measure 67 versus 73, that will actually tell you that they might be in agreement. So here, I, you know, we take an experiment where the likelihoods, they have the same absolutely distance, but now the, the difference here is between your prior. Your prior for this parameter is truly large here, and it's small, and that changes how this Bayesian methods, for example, this evidence ratio, tells if things are in agreement or disagreement for the same likelihood difference. Therefore, you have to think very carefully, what is your prior, what is, what is the knowledge you know when you do this? And physicists don't do that. They just say, I would just take the largest prior possible, Omega meta from, you know, from zero to a million, because I want my data to be independent of my thinking. But, but, but by making this choice, you are affecting um, uh, the, all the Bayesian estimators. So you need calibration through simulated data, and that's what I'm doing here. Um, <coughs> the first author, and we are gonna publish this very soon, uh, and I'm just, just showing here, for example, for, for noise realization of the dark energy, how the evidence ratio behaves, given our choices of priors, and we show that this is different from um, the standard um, way you interpret things, which is through this so-called Jeffrey scale. So, for now, I ended, uh, and I just uh, hope to have convinced you that you know, uh, there are interesting physics in multiple epochs of the universe, that they all affect uh, the structure formation and the expansion today. Uh, and, uh, and, and my way of approaching dark energy, uh, here is Lambda, is to try to go through d three different axes. I'm trying to understand how the geometry works, how structure formation works, but also trying to understand how the early universe and intermediate universe worries, and I need, and, and I believe, and I have been defending this for many years, that you need the three of them uh, to, to try to understand dark energy. Uh, thank you. I have a, I have a question. So since I have the mic, are you okay? Yeah. <laughs> okay, go ahead. I've just got some water here. The question is, is there any other problem but the cosmological, con uh, the uh, Hubble constant uh, to be explained in the standard model? 
in the cosmological standard model yes. is that what's the, what's the, what are the other problems? Um. What are the problems that the standard model uh, doesn't explain but the Hubble constant these days, this discrepancy? So one of them, uh, and I cannot, I cannot tell you how, for how much, or like what is the statistical significance, because we're, we're, is that, uh, is counting the number of clusters in the universe. Like, you know, if structure formation happens too fast, then you have a lot of very massive clusters. And so the number of them can tell, uh, you know, information about the standard model, and there's a, like a very precise uh, 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 prediction on how many should we see uh, in the universe, and that might be off. Um, I, can, I cannot say more than this, but uh, so there's this crack. Uh, so that's, that's one of them. Uh, and, and, and the mere existence of acceleration, if you truly, dark energy has to have some weird conditions to produce acceleration. So even if the H naught was correct, the mere existence of acceleration could indicate that gravity works as a GR here, but it's completely different. Uh, on those scales, so unless you believe that you solve the cosmological problem from a, from a theoretical point of view, why it has such a small value, that is also a, a problem, not in the feeding of the data, but in explaining what dark energy means. Well, um, you know, standard model, the standard model in particle physics have, has a, a, a number of free parameters. So adding one free parameter to GR is not that bad. So I don't see why this is worse than adding a number, dozens of um, free parameters in the standard model of particles. Yeah. But I, I'm talking about, you know, let's assume lambda CDM, what are the real tensions, not small discrepancies, but real tensions that we have to face in cosmology these days? Because my question, actually my question goes much beyond your work, is I see one problem and Maybe this is a systematic. There is a, some systematics in the either CMB or in supernova measurements. So the que my question is: Does it justify all these models? That it's very deep. Well, uh, another question is: Work together, and because the theories are getting very complicated. Uh, and the experiments are getting very complicated. It's the direct talk, it's almost impossible, except for a few genius that can do that. But you know, most theories don't understand what's going in the data. Most experiments don't understand what's going to the theory, and, and I, I have to make them talk. So I have to understand what the, th the experiment is doing, not to the same amount that the experiments do. I have to understand what the theories are doing, not to the same mathematical, uh, uh, no. Um, skills of a theorist and have to make them talk. So that's why cosmology, I think, is a, very, is a field where there's truly a phenomenologist uh, approach and, a, and, and, and where uh, the job of a phenomenologist is important. Just a... So going back to this non-minimal thing, um, why, for example, just to follow up from George's question, why is it natural to say that the dark energy decouples from the matter? Why, why, why do you assume this? Why is this more attractive than, than assuming that it is? For, from a theoretical point of view, I, I, I don't know. I, I, so why did you put it into your Because Because it gives, me that concept, it gives me something that I can test. If I put this, then there's this consistent that I can okay, test. But there's no a priori reason why this is preferable to... No, but, but, but I believe that if you're a theorist trying to build a theory of dark energy, you like to know okay. if I can rule out that hypothesis. Okay. okay, so I had another kind of question, which is... So I heard talks that... I'm not sure I have, uh, I have an opinion on this, but they say that the Z, I can interpret as some kind of energy scale. Z, the, the redshift? The redshift. Okay. So from that point of view, I would say that late universe and early universe are unrelated, just use effective field theory, and they're different energy scales. One should have nothing to do with the other, or should have very little to do with the other. Yeah. Is that just the wrong perspective? Um, it, it is. I'm saying wrong, but l let me say what is mine. Maybe the... F 
especially if it's really early, like the physics and uh, gut theory, uh, geo theories or like nucleosynthesis, things, it might not be the same as uh, um, the physics of dark energy at very low uh, redshift because it's lower energy scale. But, uh, for example, of the cosmic micro background, the light that's emitted there has to travel to the, to the late universe to arrive as here. And things that happen here will change its path, will change its polarization. For example, uh, there is, uh, wh wh why is it difficult to measure uh, gravitational waves in the CMB? Uh, because uh, from the, 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 the effective field theory point of the CMB, there is a symmetry that says, oh, well, you have two polarization states, E and B, and because of a symmetry in the CMB, primordial, you don't produce any B. B is just zero. So if you measure any B, the only way you can produce B, so this is the BB spectrum, and this is L, so this will be zero except for inflation. So that is the theory. But uh, light has to travel from the CMB to us, and gravitational weight rotates the polarization, the original polarization state. So gravitational lensing takes E modes, and produces into B. And, and even though there was B equals zero, today we, under, we, we measure a B spectrum that overwhelms the inflation in most of these scales. So that's why you cannot make this separation because things have, it's not like a lab that you can actually isolate the energy scales we don't want. Things have to travel to us, and when they travel, you mix them up. At least in the observational side, how do you extract information from each one of them and get mixed it up because, you know, things travel to us. So this is a very good example. So we have to de-lens, that's why people say CMB de-lensing, we have to de-lens these guys back to the original E so we can see this Nobel Prize signal here that we thought we have saw before, but it's not true. And why we have thought we have before? Because there's another way to generate them which is through dust. Another example, why you have, so that's why people in inflation now is talking about dust models and how it's amazing to go to a conference and see people that only did inflation to try to mod, model dust particle shapes and distribution of size. They have to know this because without this, if they cannot clean that signal, they cannot get inflation. So that's, 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 the, that's the connection. Yeah, of course. Are black holes uh, ruled out as candidates for dark matter? No. <laughs> no? No. In what, uh, with what sizes? This. Thirty? Thirty solar oh, masses. Okay. You can About what you see in LIGO. Well... Right? Yeah, but you cannot go too far, too, you cannot go to 100 solar masses, yeah, but yes. So there's, there's a nice plot, uh, you can see in cosmology, I can actually uh, bring you and t talk to you offline, okay. that has, is like the fraction of dark matter that can be sourced by, uh, uh, by um, black holes uh, over black hole mass, and, and basically, like, if this is one, it looks like this. Uh, so in one, if it's too big, the CMB can probe. If it's too light, I think, I, think there are, I don't remember exactly, I think the gamma can probe. Okay. And, and there's a sweet spot here where you can still have, not exactly one, but it can be close enough to one to be very interesting. So it's still possible. That's interesting. Okay, thank you. Okay, so let's thank 